Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be going over an introduction to organic chemistry, so make sure that you're following along with your note packets and then if you have any additional questions, you ask me tomorrow. Alright, so what is organic chemistry? Uh, it's the study of all matter containing carbon. That's kind of like a basic definition. There are some carbon containing compounds that aren't considered organic, but again, that's like a rarity. So anytime you see a carbon containing compound, it's most likely going to be considered organic. Well, let's talk a little bit about what makes carbon special compared to the other elements on the periodic table. So we've heard the term carbon-based life forms before, but why is carbon so essential to life? Well, it seems to be connected with the fact that it can form up to four covalent bonds with other atoms, but more importantly, with itself. So what does that mean? That means that carbon can bond to other carbon atoms. In fact, it can bond to four more carbon atoms. So every time you have a carbon atom in something, in sort of like a larger molecule, you can end up with, you know, even a larger molecule, presumably, by chemical reactions that cause car carbon to carbon bonds. And so this is one of the reasons why organic molecules tend to form such long chains and why living things are sort of, you know, an array of different carbon-containing compounds all linked up together. Because it seems as though once you have, like, you know, sort of this bonding capability, you end up with these long chains of organic molecules that are the building blocks for life. So yeah, even though this is just, you know, a big chunk of weird graphite, which is, you know, an allotrope of carbon, um, it actually is sort of like something that can be used as a building block of life. So what does organic actually mean? Organic is a term that's used all over the place, but from a chemical perspective, there's a very specific definition. When we use the term organic in everyday language, normally we think of like, you know, something to do with food, but from a chemical standpoint, all it means is that there's a carbon-based backbone for a molecule. And so that means that if something has a carbon chain in it, it's organic. If something has a carbon-based backbone, quote-unquote, like it says here, then it's definitely going to be considered an organic substance. Now, back in the day, and when I mean back in the day, I mean like, you know, in the 1700s and stuff like that, it was thought that only living things could make organic compounds, and it makes sense. Organic compounds come from life, so that must mean that only living things can make them. And so organic chemistry used to be defined this way. Okay, it used to be defined as the study of chemical compounds that were made from living things. But now we have biochemistry, which really is defined as the study of chemical compounds that are found in living things. So they're two different things. Biochemistry is not organic chemistry, but if you were to look in like an old enough reference manual, then you probably would find, you know, them practically being described the same way. So who is responsible for this paradigm shift from things that are living to just things that have carbon in them? Well, it's this guy right here. It's Frederick Wohler. He was able in 1828 to manufacture urea. Now, yes, urea is exactly what you think it is. It's found in urine. Okay, and so urea, which is found in urine, urine comes from a living thing, so therefore it's organic. Okay, that was kind of the logic behind it. And that means that only living things produce urine. What he was able to do is synthesize urea outside of a body. He was able to do a simple chemical reaction and get this compound. And that compound was considered organic. So he was able to artificially manufacture urea and literally invented modern organic chemistry as a discipline. And so Frederick Roller is actually who you can blame for all of the problems you'll probably have at some point in Unit 14. So let's talk about the different types of carbon-containing compounds. So the first ones are the most influential type of organic compound, and it's called a hydrocarbon. Now here's the nice thing. The word hydrocarbon is exactly what it sounds like. Hydro, hydrogen, and then we have carbon, carbon. They contain only hydrogen and carbon. That's what makes them different from all other types of organic compounds. Like, look back at urea's picture, had an oxygen in it, had a couple of nitrogens. It is not a hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbons are the simplest type of organic molecule, okay? And so there are three broad categories of hydrocarbon, and they are called, and they sound very similar, so make sure that you write them down correctly, alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, okay? Alkanes have single bonds only. 
alkenes have at least one double bond, and then alkynes have at least one triple bond. Okay? So take a look at these pictures. Right here, oops, wrong color. Right here we have only single bonds. Okay, that's why we have these lines here. Over here we have a double bond. And then all the way at the beginning here we have a triple bond. So this would be an alkyne, this would be an alkane, and this would be an alkene. Okay, again, they sound very similar, so make sure you know which one's the double bond, which one's the single bond, and which one has at least one triple bond. So what are our types of hydrocarbons? Okay, so hydrocarbons are sometimes classified by their structure and shape, and I just realized it should be there. I'll probably fix that. So hydrocarbons are sometimes classified by their structure or shape. So not only do we have, you know, three broad categories of hydrocarbons, but we also have three general shapes, okay, or structures. The first is called a chain. It is just a straight row of carbons. This, even though it only has one carbon in it, is a chain. Next up, we have branched chains. That's a row of carbons with at least one side chain. So this is a branch chain. Right here is an example of a branched chain. So I'll use this. Right here, this would be like our chain, our starting chain or something. Okay, and then these little guys are branches branching off from them. So they kind of look like trees. And the reason why they look like trees is because, well, that's where we get the term branch from. Next up, rings. Rings are... That's a, just a row of carbons that connect back to itself. And so we have right here, this is a really good example, it's benzene, a good example of a ring structure. So you're probably thinking to yourself, what am I supposed to draw in those boxes? Well, we're just going to draw, you know, an example of a chain, a branched chain, and then a, um, a ring. So here's going to be our example of just a chain, okay? And so we're going to do CH3, CH2... CH3. This actually has a name. This is a structural formula for propane, which you may or may not have heard of before. If you've ever done any grilling, that's what propane looks like structurally. Now what about a branched chain? Okay, so we can draw that too. I'm just going to make one little change to my drawing. Okay, so that looks similar to propane, but now I have this. I have a branch, okay? And so this is like our sort of long central chain, and then this would be our branch. That's what makes it a branched chain, and actually we can name this too. Uh, it's going to sound a little bit more complicated, but this is 2-methyl propane, like that. 2-methyl propane. So last but not least, uh, I've decided, let's see, hmm, we're going to draw this guy, all right? So we're going to do, we're going to make a pentagon, basically, out of carbons. This is a real compound, by the way. And then we're just going to draw little hydrogens going out to the side like this. So little hydrogens going out like this, all over the place. And so this guy has a name, too because it has five carbons. This is what makes it a ring, by the way. This is the ring shape that we're talking about. They all, right there, they all connect to each other again, okay? And so what this guy is called, uh, this is called cyclopentane. Cyclopentane. Okay, so those are our three examples that you should draw in those boxes. We literally just drew different compounds inside of those boxes. So how can we represent organic compounds? Well, there are a couple of ways of doing it, okay? And so the first is using just regular old chemical formulas like we've been using. And all that does is it expresses the proportion of atoms using elemental symbols and then using subscripts. So why is this a useful way of representing an organic compound. Well, it is the simplest way to represent a compound. It literally is just telling you, this is how many carbons I have, this is how many hydrogens I have. Why is this not a useful thing for us? It literally gives us no detail about the structure or shape. Here's the thing that you'll learn in organic chemistry. Structure and shape are ideal 
and they are necessary. Like, if you have a different structure or shape, you could have a whole different type of compound that does a whole different type of thing. So it's really important that we know what structure and what shape each compound has. So we don't really use chemical formulas for the most part when we're dealing with organic compounds because, for example, this guy right here could actually be a variety of different shapes, and so that means that there are actually, you know, quite a few different compounds that have that chemical formula. So in your box, just write down any one of these uh, chemical formulas. It doesn't matter which one you write down. You can even write all of them down, but just remember that's what a chemical formula looks like. Next up, we have the condensed structural formula, okay? So condensed structural formula. That expresses the general structure of a compound, and it includes subscripts, okay? And what that means is it gives you the shape, but it doesn't give you all of the detail. Okay, that's kind of the point. Why is it useful? It represents both the shape and the formula easily. Okay, so for example, in this picture, which by the way, this is going to be the picture I want you to draw in your box if you are able to, because it's actually a really good example. But this, this picture, I could find the chemical formula of this picture, and it's pretty easy. All I've got to do is just count all of the carbons I have. So I could do this. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I have nine carbons. So that would be C9. Then all I'd have to do next is count my hydrogens. And I didn't actually make this diagram, but I'm kind of a stickler for structure, and I see a mistake. So I'm going to actually probably draw this in. All right, so there should be an H here, and there should also be an H here. But anyway, now we can count our hydrogens. So let's count those away. So we've got 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So I have C9H18, okay? And that would be my chemical formula. And all I had to do was just count how many carbons and how many hydrogens I have. And the reason why I was able to do that so easily is because we have just subscripts here. Like, you know, so I have three hydrogens on this one. I have one hydrogen here. I have two hydrogens. I have one hydrogen. I have three hydrogens. I have two hydrogens. I have one. I have three. I have two. And all I have to do is add those all together. So condensed structural formulas are nice if we're interested still in the chemical formula of something. Now, why is this not useful? This amount of detail is not always required. That's something. Maybe, you know, there could be just a simpler way of drawing this that, you know, you don't need all that detail. And it doesn't show the placement of the hydrogen atoms. I just have subscripts for my hydrogen, so I really don't know what my hydrogens look like or what they're doing at all. Next up, we have structural formulas. So right here, structural formulas. That expresses the entire structure and shape of the molecule, okay, including the placement of every single hydrogen atom. Okay, why is this useful? This gives you the most detail of any type of formula. But why is it not useful? This amount of detail is also sometimes not always required, and it takes too long to draw out every single little hydrogen in a molecule. So in your box, draw this. This is the structural formula for propane, okay? And so we drew pro propane already, okay, when we dealt with just, you know, oh, this is what a chain looks like. Compare that drawing to this drawing, okay? This one takes way longer because we actually have to go in and draw every single little tiny hydrogen, okay? And so sometimes people get annoyed by that, and so they don't like structural formulas as much. Finally, this is the easiest one, but sometimes it's also the most difficult one to figure out. It's called the line structure, and it's where you express the shape of a molecule using only lines. Why is this useful? This is the easiest way to convey the shape of a molecule. Why is it not useful? It gives you the least amount of detail. I don't know where my hydrogens are. I don't know how many of them I have. It's really, really difficult to try to actually get those, you know, sort of ideas from just a line structure. And so what you're going to draw for your line structure, hmm, draw this one. Draw just this, you know, array of what looks like kind of little hills. Here's the, here's the interesting part. Each, like, line segment here, each dot that I'm putting, each point, that represents a carbon. 
So that's actually what this is. This is a long chain of carbons. Now you might say, why does it look like a whole bunch of bumps going up and down? When we actually build molecules, like you know, propane and butane, we draw them frequently as just being flat. You know, so like, well, don't draw this, but you already have, so I guess that's okay. Uh, this is how we represented propane in our first drawing. It makes it look like it is literally just a straight line of carbons. But if you were to actually look at the molecule, the molecule actually looks like this. So you have one carbon down here, one carbon up here, one carbon down here. It actually has this sort of weird, almost pointy shape to it. And so line structure gives us that detail. Um, it gives us the shape, not detail, uh, but it also doesn't tell us a whole lot about the molecule. And that's literally it. So we're actually done. And uh, be prepared for tomorrow, because tomorrow we're going to go really deep into, you know, sort of how to write out a whole bunch of different um, organic compounds. If you have questions, ask.